truly an honor to join you today. I will go right into it. Uh, I am someone from the edge. Um, I grew up in rural Africa, but um, if you were to tell me that my life after 39 years uh, would land me in this particular stage, I would have told you you're crazy. Um, so uh, really, um, where's the clicker? Okay. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> All right. Um, great. So let's start. Um, let me take you back to 2008. Um, this was in Kenya. I had just come back from Chicago where um, I was working as a data analyst uh, for a company there, and I was there for holidays. And up to that point, the country was on, up, on an upward trajectory. Um, but one of the biggest things that hit us on that, um, on, in early 2008 was this constraint or this problem or adversity where a, an, a country that was really set to take off was just about to self-destruct with violence. Uh, there was a political situation where there was post-election violence. It was a very difficult reality to be faced with because by and large, the country was very peaceful and we felt very happy to be coming back and engaging uh, with uh, a country that we love. And at that particular time, earlier in the year, I had met my colleagues, Eric, Ori, David, Daudi, and others uh, at a TED conference in Arusha. And when faced with this adversity, the first thing that we did was we came together online and even though the speeds were very, very dismal, it was very slow, we were still able to communicate and put together a platform because we wondered what would happen if we could change how information flows so that we could inform each other and inform others. And that's how we, we started the organization called Ushahidi, which became the anchor organization that begat iHub and a few other companies that I will talk about today. So one of the things that we can learn from Ushahidi, uh, Nathaniel Bullard, a friend, put this best, that when we're thinking about what design can do, it's that when we look at function first, when we looked at our challenge or the adversity at that particular time uh, of dealing with the way information flowed, because frankly, we couldn't really turn to TV. Uh, in the face of violence, there was actually, they were playing the sound of music. So that was pretty difficult for us to, uh, if there was one time where you needed blanket coverage of what was happening, it was then, but live broadcasts were not allowed. So we used the internet to create a platform where people could SMS in with whatever device that they had. So we're not talking high tech here. Uh, Clay Sharkey, who's an author, called it mixed tech. The idea of using what's available and what is effective and what is functionally useful at that particular point. So that's point number one, that through Ushahidi, um, you can scale. And what if this idea could be made open source and available for others to use around the world? It took a while uh, for us to scale this and to get it translated into more than 30 languages, to get it into more than 150 countries. And how we did that was by creating a community but then also responding to problems that happened in other places like Haiti or Japan. So the lesson again is this, adversity and constraints can be a resource for all of us. So whatever neighborhoods, be it here uh, in Holland or wherever you come from, look around and look at what adversity is there in your neighborhood that you can do something about. Um, something that you can collaborate with others to address. Now, another thing that we learned from working on Ushahidi is that we are now in a very global, connected ecosystem. And Joy Ito, who is the director of MIT Media Lab, said this, that we're operating in an ecosystem now where you may not be the only genius with the you know, the bright idea that some of your most important work will be done in collaboration with others. So please keep that in mind because that is certainly true for me, that some of the most important work that I've done so far has actually been in collaboration with others. 
and part of creating an environment that opens the door for others. And by opening up the door for others, you're looking at creating community. This is not trivial. Creating community like what uh, Ravi has done with Design in Daba in South Africa and others around the world. It's very difficult, but it's deeply fulfilling, and it's truly the way that we will change the world from a foundational point where we look at things from the bottom up, looking at community as the bedrock on which we build on the ideas, we build on, um, we build on the technology, we build on platforms, and that's how we create change in the world, by really paying attention to the community. And that's one of the things that I learned from working at Ushahidi, is that without the community and without people who can pitch in and translate a platform to a language that they are bilingual in, we couldn't possibly have the many deployments of Ushahidi that we see around the world. So that's the second point that I'd like to make, that diversity is truly a resource. And uh, a friend of mine called Adewale Ajadi, who writes about complex systems, which are actually uh, many in African culture, that's a whole other talk, uh, we'll just leave that aside, but diversity and complexity is actually something to embrace. Um, I'm speaking about this a few days after the Brexit uh, thing that happened in, uh, in the UK. And it, it makes all of us really sad because the diversity that is there in the European Union is actually a very important resource for innovation, for creating solutions that you may not even think of right now, for other generations and other personal stories that, like mine, became richer because I was working with developers from Bulgaria, um, volunteers from Tokyo, uh, developers in Nairobi, in Chicago, in Tennessee, in various parts of the world, in Korea, and they all taught me and enriched my life. So if we become insular and try to hive off ourselves, we are robbing ourselves of richness that could truly transform our world. So I come from Africa, back to Africa where um, there are 54 countries, so clearly quite diverse, uh, more than 2,000 languages. It's sparsely populated, um, harsh conditions uh, and cultural nuances. But what I'd like to tell you is this, when I look at this, I actually look, celebrate it because it's something that brings so much color and so, much, um, so many challenges, and there's so many problems that are yet to be tackled happily because we now have more, uh, quite a generation of young people who are tackling some of these problems. And it's not just about a diversity in terms of racial or ethnic makeup, it's also diversity in terms of gender balance. There's a recent report by Dahlberg that says, um, Racial or ethnic uh, diversity can add three, between 300 and 370 billion dollars annually, just in the tech field. And increasing female leadership in the C-suite can increase GDP from 0 0.5, between 0 0.5 to 0 0.6 addition to GDP. So really, it makes business sense. So it's not just about the richness, it's also about something that is really a no-brainer. So let me take you back to Nairobi, where we have more than 16,000 members at the iHub, and it's a place that encourages serendipity, and uh, it, it encourages creativity and collaboration. It is now in transition, but one of the things that we do not take for granted is the fact that that community in iHub is diverse, not just in gender, but also in its uh, overall makeup. Now, another thing that I wanted to share with you today uh, about what design can do is this idea of innovative business models. Um, how many of you have heard of M-Pesa? Fantastic. So M-Pesa is a mobile money system um, that is very popular in Kenya, but it's also spreading around the world. 
And one of the things that I wanted to point out about M-Pesa is that now 40% of Kenya's GDP flows through this very simple system. It actually uses very simple technology called USSD, where you text in, you add credit into your mobile wallet, it becomes available for you to then transfer to other, uh, other people or to pay a bill or to, uh, to buy airtime. It's become part and parcel of life and business in Kenya. So all those adversities, when it came to the challenge of moving money from one part of the country to another part of the country, you would look at that and go like, ah, oh, such a pain. But look at 40% of Kenya's GDP is flowing through this very system. So these challenges can enable us to create uh, innovative business models, and it's about starting in a place where you do not have legacy, you don't have um, the burden of old phone lines that you have to use. You can use new mobile systems or other new systems that are being created now. Um, I mentioned earlier about some of those uh, the reality on the ground about unreliable power, unreliable connectivity, and challenging environments. There are two more companies and two more stories that I will tell you about before closing. And uh, one is, um, uh, the first one is Brick, and then the next one is Mcopa. But just before I get into that, have a look at this. 70% of Africa is still not connected. And connected, I'm talking here about uh, broadband, about bandwidth. So there's still quite a bit of a challenge, and that's a challenge that my team uh, is ready to, uh, to embark on. Actually, we've been embarking on it and uh, figuring out innovative ways to extend educational content to the edges of the network and extending connectivity and supporting organizations on the ground. Another thing is this challenge of um, electricity. 600 million Africans lack access to electricity. You may look at that and go, tough. A company that looks at that statistic, and specifically in Kenya, is Mcopa, and comes up with a solar system that um, they create a pay-as-you-go service where this is how it works. You have a solar panel, and you pay for it over time through the system that I mentioned before, M-Pesa. And what happens here is it's an innovative way of changing the affordability of a, a solar system and making it available to more people uh, than ever before. And what is the impact of this? We have an impact of more than 250,000 homes having light in their houses. When you have people as far out as Narok, uh, where the beautiful Maasai women live, please excuse me, I, I'm sorry, I forgot her name. I totally would have said her name. Uh, but they are able to do homework at night. Uh, they're able to reduce the use of kerosene, which is really, really destructive to their lungs. And there is light, and they, they have a better sense, uh, a better quality of life. The other company, which I am involved in, is Brick. When we saw the challenge of connectivity, one of the areas, uh, one of the people that we worked with uh, was someone, uh, was a headmaster in a, in a local school, uh, which my colleague Nivi uh, was working with. And he said, our challenge is internet. And at that particular time, Nivi and her team were deploying uh, tablets with content. But the problem was to update the content, they would have to bring back all the tablets to the iHub, sync it, and then take them back to the school. And we looked at this quite, it's, a, it's quite a big challenge, this issue of education and technology. It's a vast market with the real potential. Uh, it's estimated that in 2050, there'll be more than 800 million school-going Africans. And as BRIC, we look at the challenge of where we are. So when we look at that tough environment, and we, we wanted to create technology where the kids could be able to use the tablets, and it wouldn't, if they dropped them, uh, or if there was water that spilt on them, that the tablets would still be usable and you wouldn't have to replace them. So 
Um, that's one of the first generation tablets, but the current generation tablets is rugged and can handle even a 70 centimeter drop onto concrete and um, it's sealed so that you can use it. One more example is we put all of that together. We put the connectivity, content, and computing into this one box. Let's have a look. At Brick, we truly understand the challenges of digital education in Africa. Just having devices and getting connectivity won't solve the education gap. We have to look at the bigger picture of delivering a sustainable platform for education. So we took what we had learned from working with Kenyan schools. We took the rugged products that we had been building at Brick and we put them together into the first fully integrated education platform designed in Africa for Africa. We introduce the Kio Kit. The Kio Kit combines the connectivity of the brick, the server and content capacity of the brick bag, and 40 of our Africanized Kio tablets into a simple integrated platform that instantly turns any school into a digital classroom. The entire solution fits into a secure, rugged, and weather resistant case. To keep the setup simple, the Kio Kit only has one cable, its power core. Because the classroom experience is so important to us, we designed the entire platform to be turned on and off from a single button. The Kio Kit revolutionizes the very idea of having technology in the African classroom. We don't just think about these ideas in our Nairobi lab. We spend a lot of time in classrooms across Kenya, observing, experimenting, and getting valuable feedback from both the teachers and the students. One lesson we learned from our earlier design iterations is that the tablet charging connection is the greatest single point of failure for devices used by children. So we engineered the Kio not to require cable for charging. The Kio kit includes the fast practical use of wireless charging for education tablets, where the student simply drops their Kio into the kit and it begins charging. Another thing we observed in the classrooms was the teacher's challenge in describing how to put on the headphones correctly. So we color coordinated the earpieces to make giving instructions even easier. A common issue faced by schools in Africa is power interruptions. Once charged, the cues on the entire kit can run through a typical eight-hour school day. In off-grid environments, you can even run the entire system using solar. The Kio Kit stores all the educational content on it so that you don't need to be connected to the internet or power for it to work. This means a school child in Trukana can get the same access to learning as a child in Nairobi. <laughs> Lovely. So what we have found is that we have actually gone to places like, to, like Turkana. These are in northern parts of Kenya. And these are areas where you have challenges with electricity. And we have actually designed a new solar solution that goes alongside the Kio kit. And the amazing thing is for the, for the schools that we tried this in, they had classes in the evening for women to come and learn and also find out about what else is there in terms of knowledge around the world. So imagine for a moment what happened. What would happen if we connected even more people online? And not only that, if we extended education and connectivity to the farthest reaches of Africa, of Kenya, of Tanzania, of Malawi, of all these different places where the Kio kit has already been deployed, and now our challenge is to extend that all over the world. We've even extended it all the way to Solomon Islands. When we started this, if you'd asked me, do you plan on going to Solomon Islands? <laughs> I wouldn't have had an answer for you. I thought you would be crazy. But this is what happens when you connect people and when you look at function and help, uh, and look at function and have that as a driving force for what you design for. And this is not just about Kenya. It's also about challenges that you hear about in inner cities uh, like in Chicago. 
Um, this, there's a recent Mozilla report that showed that there were access issues in inner city Chicago for people to get to a library where they can access internet access, uh, they can access the internet in order to learn, they were having challenges. So this is not just about African problems. These are just about problems that afflict us in different forms. And the question is, are we going to look to others uh, for innovative solutions and use what they've done so far and work with them to make the lives of others better? Last but not least is this idea that we absolutely have to look at local knowledge and networks. There are other products and things that we, my team uh, is working on, and one of those is to look at local knowledge and networks in creating appropriate messaging uh, through our connectivity products, and then also making sure that we are iterating and taking that into account. So I'll leave you with this thought that from somebody who came from the edge and I'm at a place where it may be considered the center of what design can do, is this idea of innovating at the edge and bridging to the core. Thank you very much.